in the name of Allah, the Islam. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbi shuhali sadri. Wa yassir li amri. Wa ahlu al-ugdata min lisani yafkahu kawli. Respected chairman, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. The topic of today evening's talk is in a form of a question. Why the West is coming to Islam? And if you have to give the reply in just one sentence, the answer is the West is coming to Islam because Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. The Western world, mainly the society, it caters to certain needs of the body. It caters to the physical needs of the body. There are several religions, most of them, which only cater to the spiritual aspect, that's the soul. But Alhamdulillah, Islam is a religion which has got a dual role. It caters to the physical aspect of the body as well as the spiritual need of the soul. It has a dual role. It caters to the body as well as the soul. Islam comes from the root word salam, which means peace. It also means submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God. The glorious Quran is the last and final revelation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which was revealed to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The glorious Quran is the most positive book in the world. It's a proclamation to humanity. It's a fountain of mercy and wisdom. It's a warning to the heedless, a guide to the erring, an assurance to those in doubt, a solace to the suffering, and a hope to those in despair. Let us analyze today the reasons why the West is coming to Islam. One of the important reasons is that the Western world is open-minded. Their minds aren't closed, they're broad-minded, and neither are they conservative like many other parts of the world. And that's the reason that I say when people ask me the question that I keep on traveling by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to different parts of the world, how is the response to the talks, etc. So I tell them that our job is to deliver the message of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is he who gives hidayah. Allah says in Surah Ghashiyah, chapter 88, verse number 21, For you have to admonish. You are not a manager of affair, O people's thing. But I tell them that there is a lot of difference between the Western world and the Eastern world. And if suppose, I tell them, that if one non-Muslim in the Eastern world, especially the country where I come from, that is India, if one non-Muslim in India accepts Islam, it is equivalent to 50 non-Muslims accepting Islam in the Western world. That doesn't mean one Indian is so superior, it is 50 times more superior than the Westerner. It's not that. What I'm trying to tell them is that the society in the East, especially India, it is conservative. It's narrow-minded. Even if a person likes the teachings of Islam, it's very difficult for him to accept Islam because he has several problems. Even if he likes Islam, he's afraid of the society. The society may boycott him. He may have economic problems. There may be danger to his life. He may have social problems. Therefore, even if a person likes Islam, in India, it is very difficult 
for him to accept Islam because the society is conservative and the people, they are narrow-minded as compared to the Westerners. But that is no excuse for the non-Muslims in India for not to accept Islam. They will be held responsible for that. As compared to the Westerners, I keep on giving talks, Alhamdulillah, in Middle East and various parts of the world. Some Westerners keep on following me. And after a couple of lectures, they just even after one lecture, Alhamdulillah, they like Islam so much that they accept at the end of the talk. Which is not the case in Bombay. I have to slog out, you know, and have to really for months and years together. Finally, it's not because of the efforts of the Dai that the person accepts Islam. It's because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them hidayah and gives them courage. So first reason I would say, the Westerners are more broad-minded because in the same family, the father can be a Christian, but he would not mind if the children, they accept Islam. You know, yet they can live under the same roof, which is not the case in India. Hardly will you find that the father belongs to a different religion and the children belong to a different religion. You will not find such a family. Therefore, I say that the Westerners are more broad-minded and they are not conservative as far as religion is concerned. The other important reason is, to the Western world, it is advanced in the field of science and technology. You know, the West, alhamdulillah, at least in this age, it has advanced in the field of science and technology. And according to Albert Einstein, he said, that science without religion is lame. And religion without science is blind. And the Westerners, they consider science at the yardstick. The ultimate yardstick to judge anything is science. And Alhamdulillah, Quran speaks several things about science. Though Quran is not a book of science, S-C-I-E-N-C-E. -E. It's a book of signs, S-I-G-N-S. And there are more than 6,000 signs, ayats in the glorious Quran, out of which more than 1,000 speak about signs. Those of you who have heard my talk, I've given a talk on Quran and modern signs, compatible or incompatible. Or Quran and modern signs, conflict or conciliation, which proves, alhamdulillah, that the Quran is far superior to science. So with the help of using the yardstick of the Westerners, we can prove our yardstick, which is Quran, which is far superior than science, has mentioned what they have discovered today, 1400 years ago. Since they advanced in the field of science and technology, and if we speak with them, with Hikmah, Alhamdulillah, they realize that Quran is far superior to science, and many of them come to Islam. Thirdly, Alhamdulillah, the Westerners, they like to reason out. They won't just accept anything on face value. They will reason out, they will investigate, and then only will they be convinced. They are not a group of people who believe in superstition, most of them. Neither do they adhere to blind beliefs. And that's exactly what the Quran says. And Quran shows the technique how to dawah in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 125, which says, ila sabili hasna, billati asan. That is, invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Quran always encourages reasoning. No one of the Quran says in several places, including Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 242, so that you may understand. The Quran wants the people to understand the Quran and then accept it. The Quran says in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 52, that here is a message for the humankind. Let them take warning therefrom. Let them know there is one God and let the men of understanding take heed. Quran says, let the men of understanding take heed. And Alhamdulillah, many of the Westerners, they are men of understanding. And 
they always like to question anything. Until they are convinced, they will not accept it. That's the reason if you read the Quran, the Quran is also a sort of a question answer book. No wonder if you read the Quran, it's mentioned Kalu, they say, 332 times. They say, they ask. And the Quran says 332 times, Qul, tell. It's a sort of a question answer book. For example, they ask the concerning wine and gambling, and the Quran gives the answer. They ask the concerning new moon, and the Quran says, Qul, it starts. It satisfies the intellectual of a person. And today, in most parts of the world, especially the West part of the world, you know, people are very busy. There are so many new philosophies and new things coming up that time doesn't permit us to analyze everything. The Westerners and the people around the world are very busy. So now if you bring up a new theory or a new hypothesis or a new philosophy, first they ask you that do you have any way to prove your theory wrong? Or do you have any way to prove your philosophy wrong? It's known as falsification test. The Westerners, they believe in the falsification test. Means any theory you bring forth, if you want us to analyze that theory, first show us the way how to prove your theory wrong. What will we do that will prove your theory wrong? Then we'll analyze it. Otherwise, there are thousands of things people are bringing up new things. Where do we have the time to analyze everything? If you have a way to prove your theory wrong, we will do that and prove it wrong. If we can't, then we'll agree with your theory. That's the reason Albert Einstein, when he propounded this theory of relativity, he had three ways. He said, to prove my theory wrong, do these three things, and theory will be proved wrong, and don't accept it. So for six years, they tested it out, and they agreed, and then, but natural, he got the Nobel Prize. Quran is the only religious book, and Islam is the only religion which has this falsification test. And I've discussed various falsification tests in my cassette, is the Quran God's word. I'll just mention one of them, which mainly caters to the Western mind. The glorious Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 82, Afala is the barun al Qurana, wala qana min indi garilla, lavajudu fi ikhtilaf and kasira. That do they not consider the Quran with care? Do they not ponder over the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone besides Allah, there would have been many discrepancies, there would have been many contradictions in it. So if you want to prove the Quran wrong, you take out a single discrepancy. The Quran is proved wrong. If you want to say Quran is not a word of God, you take out a contradiction. Quran will be proved wrong. It is so easy. Just take out one mistake in the Quran and the Quran will be proved wrong. So easy. Just go through the book. It will take you a few hours or a couple of days. Take out the mistake and I'll agree the Quran is wrong. It is presenting a falsification test. Throughout the ages there are falsification tests given by the Quran. But for this age, this test is there, which was applicable even that time, but today it's more applicable, you know, because today is the age of science and technology. Previously was the age of literature, poetry, etc. It had different falsification tests for that time, which is even applicable today. But this particular one is applicable for the Westerners. Not that Westerners didn't try. You have several critics of Islam giving hundreds of alleged contradictions, alleged scientific errors, all of which are actually nothing but falsehood. Because if you know more about science, as Francis Bacon said, that little knowledge of science makes you an atheist. But an in-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in God. That's the reason today, the Western world, they are eliminating models of God, but they are not eliminating God. La ilaha illallah. As I mentioned, that Islam has the solutions to the problems of the West. Time doesn't permit us to discuss all the problems and solutions which Islam has. We'll just pick up a few and discuss a few of them. As I mentioned, that the Western world is drowned in materialism. It's a materialistic world. You know, more concern about trying to see the welfare of the body so much that they have been drowned in materialism. And Quran has a solution. Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 34 and 35, it says that spend of your wealth in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and give a warning to those people who bury gold and silver and spend it not in the way of Allah, those who hold their gold and silver, and spend it not in the way of Allah, announce to them a grievous penalty that fire will be produced from the wealth which they afforded. It will be heated in the hellfire and on the day of judgment they'll be branded with it on the forehead, on the flanks and on the back. And the Quran says that this life is a test for the hereafter. In Surah Mulk, chapter 67, verse number 2, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. And the Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 185, that Kullu every soul shall have a taste of death. The final recompense shall be paid on the day of judgment. And anyone who enters the garden, that is Jannah, and is kept away from the hellfire, he would have achieved the purpose of this life. For this life is but goods and chattels of deception. Quran says this life people are running after materialism, it's a goods of chattels and deception. But a person who's safe from the hellfire and enters the garden would have achieved the objectives of this life. People spend too much money, etc. And Quran has a solution for the spendthrifts. Quran says, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 26 and 27, that spend not your wealth like that of a spendthrift. Well, do not be a spendthrift, because spendthrifts are the brothers of the devil. That means if you spend excessively, you are a brother of the devil. And today, throughout the world, including the Western world, you have a system that in order to hoard more wealth and to gain more wealth, you use your wealth to eat other people's wealth. In English, it's called as bribing. The Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 188, that squander not your wealth on vanities and do not use your wealth in order to use it as baits to judges so that you may eat other people's wealth. That means do not use your wealth as a bribe, as bait to judges so that you may eat other people's wealth. Bribing is prohibited in Islam. And the Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter 49, verse number 11 and 12, that let not one group of men laugh at the others. You may never know the latter may be better than the former. Let not one group of women laugh at the other. You may never know the latter may be better than the former. Do not call each other by nicknames. Don't be sarcastic to one another. Avoid suspicion. For suspicion, in some cases, is a sin. Do not spy on one another. Do not backbite. Do not call each other by nicknames. And do not slander behind their backs. Do not backbite. Are you ready to eat the dead meat of your brother? The Quran says that if you backbite, if you speak against somebody's back, it's as though you're eating the dead meat of your brother. And eating dead meat is prohibited in the Quran. Speaking bad about someone without proof, slandering him without proof, is prohibited in Islam. Slandering someone behind his back when he doesn't have an opportunity to clarify is double sin. Eating dead meat is a sin. Eating dead meat of your brother. The cannibals who eat meat, even they don't eat the meat of their own brother. So backbiting is as good as eating the dead meat of your brother. And Quran says, nay, you would abhor it. This backbiting and slandering in the garb of freedom of expression, you know, hidden behind the term freedom of expression, you find it very prevalent throughout the Western world. You know, people abusing each other, slandering each other, in word commas, freedom of expression. The Quran says in Surah Humaza, chapter 104, verse number one, Wailul lumaza, woe to every kind of scandal monger and backbiter. The problem today, which the West is facing, and it has also seen to it that the other parts are facing because of it, is riba, is interest. Today, the Western world is in problem because of riba, because of interest. And they're seen to it 
that they've passed this disease even to the other parts of the world. It started in England by the King of England. He said that you give money, I'll keep it with you, and then I will give you interest, fixed interest on it. And that's how the present interest-based banking system started. And they have spread this fever, this disease, throughout the world. The Quran mentions about riba, the word riba is given in the Quran in no less than eight different times. It's mentioned in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 130. In Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number 161. It's mentioned in Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 39. Thrice in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 275. It's also mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 276. And in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 278. The word riba is mentioned in the glorious Quran no less than eight times. And why it is haram, etc. I've given the talk on interest free economy promulgated by the Quran. For people who want to know the reason why Islam has prohibited riba, and the riba includes interest over and above, people say that, oh, no, riba doesn't include interest, modern interest. It only means usury. And I've described this in detail. People can avail of my video cassette, interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran, which gives more detail. Time doesn't permit us to go into the minute details of economics in this talk. But just like to give the translation of two verses of the Quran, that is Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, was 278 and 279, which says that, oh, you believe, give up your demands of riba, of interest. And if you give not your demands of riba, interest, take notice of a war from Allah and his Rasul. I mean, anyone who deals with interest, Allah and his Rasul will wage a war against you. There are various sins mentioned in the glorious Quran, which are big sins, gunaya kabira. But this particular sin, besides being a grave sin, it also says that anyone who deals with interest, Allah and his Rasul will wage a war against you. So if you deal in interest, you're challenging Allah and his Rasul for a war. Furthermore, if you see in the Western world, we have people especially the children, they don't respect the parents. It's more in the Western world as compared to the Eastern world. And nowadays, in the new era, you have special child abuse cells. If you go Western world in America and in other European countries, you can phone the police, the special child abuse cell, and you can even threaten your parents. If your parents scold you too much, you can you better be careful, otherwise I'll dial that number. And the parents, they understand, okay, now he means business. You're giving rights to everyone. Rights are there in Islam. They've even given rights to children. The maximum is in Islam. But the Quran says, La taglu fi dinukum, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 171. Do not commit excesses in your religion. But natural children should be protected. But now, in the garb of protection, the children, they are threatening, they are blackmailing the parents, if they want something and if the parents don't give, they can blackmail. You can even give fake calls, no problem. The police will come, may harass the parent, may not harass him, but there can be problems. Several places in the Quran says that you should respect your parents, several places. In Surah Luqman, chapter number 31, verse number 14, in Surah Hakaf, chapter number 46, verse number 15, in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 151, several places. But specifically, it says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 23 and 24, it says that after worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the next duty is respecting your parents. The Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 23 and 24, that Allah has ordained for you that you worship none but me, and that you be kind to your parents. And if any one of them, or both of them, reach old age, do not even say a word of contempt. Don't even say oof to them. You can't even say oof to them. But lower to them your wing of humility and address them with honor and pray to the Lord that cherish them as they cherished me in childhood. Imagine, the Quran says, if any one or both of your parents reach old age, you cannot even say oof to them. 
In the Western world, you have the concept of old age home, where the parent gets old, put them into the old age home. There's no concept of old age home in Islam. Because the duty of the children and the relatives is to look after the elderly people. They have to respect them. They have to love them. They have to behave with them with compassion. Unlike the Western world, which moment a child gets an adult, the parents may have looked after the child, but moment he feels he can stand on his own two feet, then he shows his back to the parents. The common problem which is there in the Western world is adultery. It is fornication. And the glorious Quran says, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 32, that come not close to adultery, for it is an evil opening road to other evils. Adultery is an evil opening road to other evils. That is the reason in Islam, marriage is compulsory. There is no monasticism in Islam. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number seven, in the book of Nikah, chapter number three, hadith number four, that, oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married should get married. And our beloved Prophet said, that anyone who marries completes half his deen. Once during question and answer time, somebody asked me, that does it mean that if I marry twice, I complete my full deen? What did the Prophet mean by saying marriage completes half your deen? What he meant? That marriage prevents you from promiscuity, from homosexuality, from fornication, which are half the evil in the society. Only if you marry do you have an opportunity to be a husband or a wife. Only if you marry do you have an opportunity to be a father or a mother, which are very important duties in Islam. Therefore, the Quran says that marriage is a misaq. A sacred covenant in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 21. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 21, that amongst his signs, he has made for you mates of like nature, so that you may dwell in them with tranquility, and he has put love and mercy between your hearts. Marriage is compulsory in Islam. Today, one of the biggest problems that the Western world is facing, which is not so much in the Eastern part of the world, is the surplus of women. You have more women in the Western world. In the Eastern world, the reason is because of female infanticide. If this evil practice stops, even in the Eastern world, this problem will be there. If you analyze, the glorious Quran says, and gives the solution for this problem, in Surah Nisa, chapter number four, verse number three, that marry women of a choice in twos, threes, or fours. But if you can't do justice, marry only one. That means a person can marry two, threes, or fours if he can do justice. If he can't, marry only one. But at the same time, the Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 129, it is impossible for you to do justice between your wives. So do not turn away from them altogether. Hear what the Quran is referring to that where it comes to justice as love is concerned. It's difficult, it's impossible to love both your wives equally. Even a mother, she loves her children. But no mother can say that I love 100% exactly both my children the same. Can't be possible. She can love both the children, alhamdulillah, very much. But no mother can say I love exactly both my children at the same level. It's not possible. There has to be some Apollo. But overall, there should not be injustice. So Quran says, it's impossible to justice between our wives, but don't turn away from them altogether. Regarding the other things, where it comes to money, time, etc., you should be just between your wives. If you buy one house for your wife, the second wife gets the same house. So the Quran says, you're only allowed to marry more than one wife if you can do justice. If you can't do justice, you cannot. Many people think that marrying more than one wife is compulsory in Islam. That's a misconception. In Islam, there are five categories of do's and don'ts. First is fard, which is compulsory. Second is mustahab, that is recommended or encouraged. Third is mubah, that's optional. Fourth is makru, that is discouraged. And the fifth is haram, that is prohibited. Polygyny, a man allowed to marry more than one wife, comes in the category 
of optional, in the middle category. There's no verse in the Quran saying that if you marry more than one wife, you get more sawa. Now let's analyze why does Quran give the permission that under certain circumstances you can have more than one wife. By nature, men and women are born in equal proportion. Male and female, they're born in equal proportion. But during the pediatric age itself, if you ask any pediatrician, he will tell you that the female child can fight the germs and diseases much better than the male child. So in pediatric age itself, there are more male children dying than female children. So in the pediatric age itself, the female population is more than the male population. As life goes on, death takes place due to accident, cigarette smoking, wars, etc. In all these cases, more male are dying as compared to female. So today in the world, there is more female population as compared to male population. It's only in certain countries like India that the male population is more than the female population. And as I said, it is because of female infanticide. And according to a report of BBC by Emily Beckinen on the program assignment, the topic was let her die, she said that every day more than 3,000 fetuses are being aborted in India alone after they identified that they're females. If you multiply this figure by 365, the number of days in a year, more than one million fetuses are being aborted every year in India after they identified that they're females. If you stop this evil practice, even in India and some other countries, the female population will exceed the male population. According to statistics, USA alone has 7.8 million females more than male. New York alone has 1 million females more than male. Out of the population of New York, the statistics tell us, one third are gays. Gays means sort of might, means come elude. That means they wouldn't like to have female life partners. There are more than 25 million gays, sodomites, in America, in USA. Another problem. 25 million. In UK alone, there are 4 million females, more than male. In Germany alone, there are 5 million females, more than male. In Russia alone, there are 9 million females, more than male. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows alone how many millions of females are there, more than males throughout the world. Suppose I agree with the Western philosophy, or non-Muslim who says, that one man should only marry one woman. And suppose my sister happens to live in America. And suppose the market is saturated. That is, every man has already taken a woman for himself. Yet, there'll be 30 million females who will not find life partners. 7.8 million as it is the excess, and the 25 million gays, if you add it to them. There are more than 30 million females who will not find life partners. Now, the only option remaining for my sister, or suppose your sister happens to be in America, and she's that unfortunate one who has not found a life partner. If she can find a man who's not married, alhamdulillah, grab him. But suppose the market is saturated what she will do. The only option remaining for her is that she either marries a man who already has a wife or she becomes public property. <laughs> no, people say, public property? Dr. Zakir using such a harsh word. I am saying that the most sophisticated word that I can use is public property. You know, I cannot use other words because I'm a die. Public property. There's no third option. And any modest woman would say she would prefer the first, becoming the wife of a man who already has a wife, than to become public property. And you know in the Western world, it's very common. People have mistresses, very common. The statistics of USA tell us that on average, one man has eight different sexual partners before he settles down with one life partner. Some may have 10, some may have 20, some may have 30, some may have less, two or one. On average, eight different sexual life partners before he settles down with one permanent one. Having a mistress is no problem. You can have one, 10, 20, 30, no problem. But if you ask any woman, when a woman becomes a mistress, she doesn't have honor. She's degraded. She doesn't have any rights. As compared to a woman, when a woman is the second wife of a man, 
she gets honor, she gets respect, she gets the rights. We in Islam, alhamdulillah, give the women the due rights. For the Western world, they can easily agree with the philosophy of a man having several mistresses. But a person having more than one wife, it doesn't go down the throat. Islam has a solution to the problems of humankind. If you analyze most of the major religions, they speak good things. Don't rob, don't cheat, etc. Islam says the same. But the difference between Islam and the other religion is that Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve that state of goodness. How to achieve that state in which these particular principles, laws can be followed. For example, all the major religions, including the Western world, says that a person should not rob. If you read the Constitution of America and Europe, it says that a citizen should not rob. And if he robs, there are certain remedies given, but it's not showing its colors. Islam too says that you should not rob. But Islam has a solution. It shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not rob. Islam has a system of zakat. That is, every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he should give 2.5% of that saving in charity every lunar year. If every rich person gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. And after this, the Quran says, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 38, As to the thief, be it a man or a woman, chop off his or her hand as a punishment from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they say, if a person, if he robs and his hands are chopped off, what about his family, what about his children, etc.? It's a ruthless law. I say Islam takes care of that. If a person has a problem, the Islamic State looks after the affairs of the family. But the question is, how many people's hands are being chopped off? The law is strict that no one dares to rob. It is so strict. So where is the question of implementing the punishment? The crime doesn't take place, so where is the question of implementing the punishment? Today, America, which happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, do you know, it also has one of the highest rate of crime, theft, robbery. I'm asking a question. If you implement the Islamic Sharia in states, every rich person gives zakat, and after that, if any man or woman robs, chop off his or her hand as a punishment. I'm asking a question. Will the rate of robbery, crime, theft in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? What will happen? Will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That's the reason I say that Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. And this is the reason why many Westerners today are coming to Islam. Let me give you another example. That most of the philosophies, most of the religions, including the Western world, says in the constitution of the countries that you should not molest a woman, you should not rape her. If you see in the constitution of America and European countries, it's there you should not molest a woman, you should not rape her. Islam says the same. But Islam shows you a way how to achieve that state in which people will not molest a woman or rape a woman. Islam has a system of hijab. Normally, the Islamic speakers, they always speak about hijab for the woman. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the glorious Quran, first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. The Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 30, that say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, and any brazen thought comes in his mind, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, the Quran says he should lower his case. There was once my friend who was a Muslim who was staring at a girl for a long time. So I told him, brother, what are you doing? It's not allowed in Islam. So he told me, our beloved prophet said, the first glance is allowed, the second is prohibited. I have not yet completed half my glance. <laughs> What did the Prophet mean by saying the first dance is allowed, the second is prohibited? That doesn't mean you can look at a woman and for 10 minutes you can look at her without blinking. You stare at her without blinking for 10 minutes. What the Prophet meant, that if you look at a woman unintentionally, don't intentionally look at her again, stare at her again. 
The next verse speaks about the hijab for the woman. The Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, that say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty, and display not her beauty except what appears ordinarily of, and draw her veil over the bosoms, and display not the beauty except in front of her husband, her father, her sons, and a big list of meram, the close relatives who she can't marry is given. And the criteria for hijab are given in the Quran, the Sahih Hadith, there are basically six criteria. For the man, the extent is from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only parts that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. Some scholars say that even this should be covered. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be so tight that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent so that you can see through. Fourth, it should not be glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. You cannot wear a sign of Christianity like a cross. You cannot wear an Om or Tika, which is a sign of Hinduism. Don't wear clothes which are identity of an unbeliever. And the last is, do not wear clothes that which resemble the opposite sex. In the Western world, we have men wearing one earring. It has certain significance, one earring. Such things are prohibited in Islam. And hijab is not confined only to the clothing. It also includes the moral conduct, the behavior, the attitude, the intention of a person. Besides hijab of the clothes, there should be hijab of the eyes, hijab of the mind, hijab of the thought, hijab of the heart. A person should even have hijab in the way he talks, the way he behaves, the way he thinks. And the reason for hijab for the woman is mentioned in the glorious Quran. In Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse 59, which says, that, O Prophet, tell your wives and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized. The Quran gives the reason, put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized. And they shall not be molested. The Quran says, hijab has been prescribed to prevent the woman from being molested. For example, if there are two sisters who are twins and who are very beautiful, they are walking down the streets of KL, Kuala Lumpur, and one twin sister, she is wearing the Islamic hijab. That is complete body covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. And the other twin sister was equally beautiful, very beautiful. She is wearing the Western clothes, the skirt or the mini. And they're walking down the street, and around the corner, there's a hooligan, there's a ruffian who's waiting for a catch, who's waiting to tease a girl. I'm asking a question, which girl will he tease? Will he tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab, or will he tease the sister who's wearing the skirt or the mini? Which girl will he tease? But natural, he will tease the girl wearing the skirt or the mini. She's inviting the people who tease her. The Quran rightly says that hijab prevents the woman from being molested. And after this, the glorious Quran says that if any man rapes a woman, capital punishment, death penalty, the Westerners may say, death penalty in this age of science and technology, in the 20th century, Islam is a barbaric religion. People may say. But when I ask this question to the Westerners, I've gone this several times, that suppose someone, God forbid, rapes your wife or rapes your mother. And if suppose you are made the judge and the rapist is brought in front of you, what punishment will you give him? And believe me, all of them said, we will put the rapist to death. Some went to the extreme of saying, we will torture him to death. So I tell the Westerners, why the double standards? Somebody rapes somebody else's wife, you say, oh, death penalty is a barbaric law. Somebody rapes your wife and your mother, you say you want to put him to death. Why the double standards? Only one person, one Westerner so far, has given me a different answer. You know what he told me? That first, I will give the rapist, if someone rapes my wife, I will first give him seven years imprisonment. And next time if he rapes my wife again, or he rapes anyone, then I will give death penalty. There are some smart Alex, you know, who give new answers. <laughs> there are smart Alex. So I told the brother, do you know the statistics of America? They tell us that when a man is convicted for rape, 
the American government says, seven years rigorous imprisonment. But the statistics tell us that those people who have been convicted and undergo the punishment, after they're let free, 95% of them again commit rape. So I told that Westerner, that American, if you like your wife to be raped again, you are most welcome to give seven years and then put him to death. I wouldn't like that. I'd put him to death on the first time, irrespective of whether he rapes my wife or your wife. If you like your mothers to be raped again and again, you can try that law. And then he got the shock of his life and I told the statistics. He said, if that is the case, then even I would put him to death the first time. Islam has the solution. We know today in America, according to statistics, according to the FBI statistics of 1990, it said that throughout the year, in the year 1990, 102,555 cases of rape were reported. And it said that out of the cases that were reported, only 16% of the total cases were reported. If you want to know the total number of rape that took place, multiply the figure by 6.25, and you get an answer of 640,968 cases of rape took place alone in the year 1990. If you divide this figure by 365, the number of days, every day on average in the year 1990, 1,756 rapes took place. I read another statistics later on, which said that every day, more than 1,900 cases of rape take place in USA alone. The year was not given, maybe it was 92, 93, the Americans got more bold, you know. 1,900. That means every 1.3 minute, one case of rape is taking place. You know, I'm here since more than last time. Already, more than 40 rapes may have taken place in USA. I'm here for one hour, and 40 rapes may have taken place in USA. And the statistics of FBI, 1990, continues and says that out of those cases that were reported, 16%, out of those reported, 10% were arrested. That means 1.6% of the rapists, they were arrested. Out of those arrested, 50% were let free before the trial. That means only 0.8% of the rapists, they underwent a trial. That means if a man commits 125 rapes, the chances that he'll undergo a trial and get a punishment is only one. 125 rapes you commit, and you get a punishment once, it's a very good gamble. 125 rapes you commit, and chances the government will give you a punishment is one. It's a very good gamble. And out of those that undergo a trial, 50% get a punishment of less than one year. Though the American law says, seven years rigorous imprisonment. But the judge said, at the first time he's committed rape. Now give him benefit of doubt. Let it be lenient. 125 rapes he commits. He comes to the trial once, and the judge says, let's be lenient. First time he's committed rape. These are the statistics of FBI of USA. I'm asking you a question. If you implement the Islamic Sharia in USA, that every man when he looks at a woman, he should lower his gaze. When any brazen thought comes in his mind. The woman should wear Islamic hijab, complete body covered, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. And after this, if any man commits rape, capital punishment, death penalty. I'm asking you a question. Will the rate of rape in America, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. And Islam, Alhamdulillah, as I said, has the solution to the problems of mankind. And one of the major problems in the Western world is alcoholism, which leads to other problems also. And the glorious Quran has the solution, it says, in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, O you who believe, most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Dedication of stones, divination of arrows. These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. The Quran says that alcoholism, gambling, these are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. You know, there is an inhibitory center in the brain, you know, which prevents you from doing things which are not correct. For example, if I have to go for call of nature, my inhibitory center will say, don't do it here, go to the toilet. If I'm speaking to elders, my inhibitory center will say, 
speak with respect. Don't abuse your parents. Don't abuse your elders. Inhibitory center is working. Now, when you're intoxicated, this inhibitory center is inhibited by the alcohol. No wonder you find many alcoholics, they urinate in the clothes itself. They speak with abusive language. They don't respect the parents when they're intoxicated. And they don't care who is in front of them. They keep on speaking anything. The inhibitory center is inhibited. And the statistics of the Western world tells us, especially of the states, that majority of the rapes that take place, majority means more than 95% of the rapes that take place, it is in the state of intoxicants. Either the rapist is intoxicated or the victim who was raped is intoxicated. More than 95%. And almost all of the cases of incest, you know incest? Incest means sex with close relatives, father and daughter, mother and son, brother and sister, incest. It's in the case when the people are intoxicated. Majority of rape, more than 95%, almost all of the incest is in the state of intoxicants. And imagine, even the AIDS, one of the reasons for AIDS to spread is alcoholism, which is very dangerous. This is one of the reasons is alcoholism. There are people who say, oh, you know, we are only social drinkers. We only are social drinkers, just once in a while, you know. Some people say in cold countries, because if we've cold, we have only one peck of beer. It's, it's not harmful. So I tell them that if you're feeling cold, why don't you sit next to the fireplace? <laughs> no, we want to drink something, you know. I said, if you want to drink something, why don't you have honey? Honey keeps you more warm than alcohol. But in the honey, there's no kick which you get in the beer. <laughs> No, people have excuses. And there are some Westerners you know, who told me, let's see, Brother Zaki. It's some, um, I don't mind accepting. But the thing is that I cannot give up my alcohol. There are certain people who only want excuse for not accepting Islam. So I told that brother, let's suppose, suppose I give you a fatwa. Suppose that for you, alcohol is forgiven. If you have alcohol, it's forgiven. Just for sake of argument. Will you accept Islam then? He was silent. People want to give excuse for not accepting it. Not that that was the only reason why he's not accepting Islam. Saying that, no, Islam is a good religion, but I cannot give up my alcohol. So I said, okay, fine. At least you give up your shirk. I will tell you that even with alcohol, no problem. Allah may forgive you. Shirk, Allah will never forgive you. If you do shirk, Allah will never forgive you. No problem. If that's your only hitch from accepting Islam, I will give you a certificate that no problem, you have alcohol, other things that will be follow of Islam. You know, this is trying to use hikmah. As I said, there are no excuses if people don't accept Islam. But then Islam has a solution to the problems. There are people who say, my father, he's a social drinker since a long time. So I tell the people, every drunkard, when you interview him, every alcoholic you interview him, and you can ask the doctors, when you interview them, no alcoholic starts drinking because he wants to become alcoholic. No alcoholic starts drinking because he wants to become a drunkard. He starts as a social drinker. And many of them end up becoming drunkards. And then some people say, you know, my father, he is a social drinker, and he is very, he has good willpower. He has only one peg a week and one peg twice a week, and he never gets intoxicated. So I tell that any human being who's been having alcohol since several years, you ask him that, have he ever been intoxicated in his life? And no one can say no, if he's been a social drinker also. At least a few times in his life, he has to be intoxicated. And if suppose during that time, if he commits a crime like rape or incest, will any modest person be ever able to forgive himself again? The loss that is done, irreparable, irreversible loss done to him and the victim is unforgivable. Suppose in the state of intoxication, if you get intoxicated even once, and suppose you commit rape, or suppose you commit incest, your father sleeps with a daughter, will he ever be able to forgive himself? Therefore, our beloved Prophet said, Muhammad it's mentioned in Ibn Majah, 
volume number three in the book of intoxicants, chapter number 30, hadith number 3392, that anything which intoxicates you in large quantity is even prohibited in a small quantity. No excuse for Nipporotol. Our beloved prophet said, it's mentioned in Ibn Majah, volume number three, in the book of intoxicants, chapter number 30, hadith number 3371, that intoxicants are the mother of all evils. It is the mother of all evils. Because of intoxicants, there's so much of evil in society. Molestation, rape, disease, etc., several. And the Prophet said that 10 categories of people are cursed, those who are involved with alcohol. It's mentioned in Ibn Majah, poem number three, in the book of Intoxicants, chapter number 30, hadith number 3380. And the Prophet said, anyone who's involved in 10 categories with alcohol, Allah's curse is on such people. Those that distill alcohol. Those who distill it for others, those who drink it, those who transport it, those who transport it for somebody else, those who serve it, those who sell it, those who utilize the profits of the sales, those who buy it and those who buy it for someone else. All these 10 types of people, Allah's curse is on these people. And there are several diseases which a person can have by having intoxicants. You can give a talk only, only on the ill effects of alcohol, which the Western world knows about it. Not that they don't know. Therefore, they have several resolutions passed, which I shall discuss one later on. And you can give a talk only listing the names of diseases will take you a full day. I'll just mention a few. One of the most dangerous diseases, which is associated with the person drinking alcohol, is cirrhosis of liver. Having intoxicants, a person can also have carcinoma of the esophagus, carcinoma of the head and neck, carcinoma of the stomach. Carcinoma of the liver. A person can have esophagitis, gastritis, pancreatitis, hepatitis. He can have cardiomyopathy. He can have angina. He can have hypertension. He can have atherosclerosis. All these are associated with having alcohol. A person can have peripheral neuropathy, cortical atrophy, cerebral atrophy, if he has alcohol. A person can be associated with strokes, with fits, with paralysis, with apoplexy. A person can have Wernicke-Kosko syndrome, which is a syndrome associated with loss of immediate memory and confabulation and retention of past memory due to thiamine deficiency, which is associated with intake of alcohol. A person can also have disease like pellagra, beriberi. He can have delirium tremens. It takes place a lot of time post-operatively and infection, and especially a person who abstains from intoxicants. And if a person is suffering from this, even in advanced hospitals, sometimes he can die. He can have several endocrine disorders, such as mixed edema, hypothyroidism, Cushing syndrome. He can have hematological disorders, like Zene syndrome. He can have folic acid deficiency, in which there is microcytic anemia. He can have platelet disorders, thrombocytopenia. Common drugs which a person takes, like flagyl, that is metronidazole, can come in between if he regularly takes alcohol. If a person takes alcohol regularly, his power to fight the diseases, his immunity goes down. There are chances of infection of the respiratory tract. There can be diseases of the lung like emphysema, like pulmonary tuberculosis, like lung abscess. And when a person vomits, his cough reflex is reduced during intoxicant, and the vomitus can go into the lung, causing lung abscess as well as emphysema. A person can even die due to this problem. And this problem of intoxicants, of alcohol, is further multiplied in the woman. A woman has more chances of cirrhosis of liver as compared to the man. And if a woman is pregnant, and if she takes alcohol, there are chances of having alcohol fetal syndrome. It even affects the baby. There are several diseases. There can be skin disease, like alopecia, eczema, paronychia, stomatitis. Several diseases. You can only list the diseases for days together and discuss for months together. But today's doctors, the Westerners, they tell us in the medical journals that alcoholism is a disease. It's a disease. It's not addiction. You know, like how you have typhoid, you have pulmonary tuberculosis, and normally people are sympathetic towards people who have disease. If a person is sick, you're sympathetic. Poor person. He has got typhoid. He has got influenza. He's suffering from illness. So today's doctors tell us that alcoholism is a disease. 
So I tell them, if alcoholism is a disease, it is the only disease that is sold in bottles. <laughs> it's the only disease that has a licensed outlet for its sale. It is the only disease that brings the revenue to several governments of the world, including the Western government. It's the only disease that is advertised in the television, on the satellite, on the radio, in the newspapers, in the magazines. It is the only disease which brings violent deaths on the highways. It is the only disease that destroys families. It is the only disease which has got no viral or germ cause. It's not a disease. The Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 790, Rich summina malish shaitan, fashtanibullah lakum tuflihun. It's not a disease, it's a Satan's handiwork. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. And Islam also has a solution. There are chances that you may get allured by these problems which the West has, which the world has. So Islam has a solution how to stay away from this problem. That is Salah. Salah doesn't only mean prayer. No, to pray means to ask for help, to beseech. In Salah, besides asking for help, we also seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance and we also praise Him. Therefore, I prefer calling Salah as a sort of programming, sort of conditioning. Because in the Salah, we are conditioned, we are programmed. But if someone says, where are you going? And if you say, I'm going for programming or brainwashing, it will sound odd. Therefore, people say prayer for Salah, I've got no objection. But that doesn't denote the complete meaning of Salah. Because in Salah, we are being reminded. When the Imam recites certain verses, after Surah Fatiha, he may recite Surah Bakra, chapter 2, verse 188, that do not use your wealth as bait for judges. That means do not bribe. He may recite Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse 90, that intoxicants and gambling is the Satan's handiwork. We are being programmed again and again. Because the world allures you so much, there are chances that we can get deprogrammed. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has shown us a solution that how to keep us reprogrammed. It's a sort of conditioning. Today, the Western world, they're afraid of only one thing. The maximum that the Western world today is afraid of is of Islam. By Western world, I mean the leaders of the Western world. They are afraid of Islam. They are afraid. You know why? Because the amount of enjoyment that they're taking is because of all the evil that's in society. Western world is afraid that if all these evils stop, if Islam becomes prevalent, all these evils will stop. Alcohol will stop, dancing will stop, and quoting will stop, raping will stop, and who will fill their coffers? So the leaders of the Western world, most of them, they are afraid of Islam. That's the reason the media regularly is pumping information against Islam. On the television, if you hear, on the radio, in the magazines, in the newspaper, all the information is against Islam, is maligning Islam. If you hear any bomb blast that takes place, it has to be a Muslim. These Muslims, they are fundamentalists and terrorists. Even the Oklahoma bombing, the headline was Middle East conspiracy. After some time, when they come to know, it was an American soldier. But that comes inside in the page, it doesn't come on the headlines. Muslims are fundamentalists, come on the headlines, and the real reason comes inside. And you have certain times, even in some countries, that a 50-year-old Muslim, he has married a 16-year-old girl. Small letters with permission that's there. But 50-year-old Muslim marries a 16-year-old girl. Headlines on the front page it will come. But when a non-Muslim, 50-year-old man, rapes a 6-year-old girl, it may come in news briefs. So news briefs, somewhere in the corner, 50-year-old man, it's so common. So with permission, if you marry with the permission of the girl, of the parents, it doesn't go down the throat. So therefore, the leaders of the Western world, they are maligning Islam. Muslims are fundamentalists, Muslims are terrorists, Islam subjugates the women, and all these. The answers of all these are given in my cassette, Women's Rights to Islam. It's even given a misconception about Islam, you can refer to that. But in spite of this, though the Western leaders are against Islam, Alhamdulillah, many Westerners are coming to Islam. The right word would not be, the question posed is, 
Why is the West coming to Islam? And the actual answer is, the West is not coming to Islam, the West is returning to Islam. Because, our beloved Prophet said, that every man is born in Deen al-Fitr. That means innate religion. He's born as a Muslim. Later on, due to the influence of elders and parents and other people, the child starts doing idol worship or fire worship. So the right word is, people say convert, I normally say revert. Convert me the person from one track goes to the other. Revert me the person on the right track, he goes to the wrong track and comes back to the right track. So the more correct and appropriate word is revert. Therefore I would say the West is not coming, the West is returning to Islam because Islam has a solution to the problems of mankind. And not only the West, Islam is not only meant for the West, Islam is meant for the whole of humankind. The glorious Quran was not revealed only for the Muslims or the Arabs or only for the Western world. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Ibrahim, chapter 14, verse number one. Alif, Lam, Ra. These are the ayahs of the book which we have revealed to thee, O Prophet Muhammad so that you may lead the humankind from darkness to light. Not only lead the Muslims or the Arabs or the Western world, lead the whole of humankind from darkness to light. Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 185 that Ramadan was the month in which the Quran was revealed as a criteria to judge right from wrong, as a guide to the whole of humankind. Quran says in Surah Al-Zumur chapter 39 verse number 41 that we have revealed to thee Prophet Muhammad the book to instruct humankind, not only to instruct the Arabs or the Muslims or the Westerners, to instruct the whole of humankind. And Prophet Muhammad was not sent as a messenger to the Muslims or the Arabs alone, or to the Western world alone. Quran says in Surah Al-Anbiya, chapter 21, verse number 107, that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to all the worlds, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to the whole of humankind. Quran says in Surah Sabah, chapter 34, Verse 28, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا قَافَةَ لِلنَّاسِ بَشِيرًا وَنَذِيرًا وَلَكِنَّ أَكْثَرَ النَّاسُ لَا يَعْمَلُونَ That we have sent thee not, but as a universal messenger, giving them glad tidings and warning them against sin. But most of the human beings, they do not know. So Islam is not a religion only for the West. It's a religion for the whole of humankind. No wonder if you read the articles of Plain Truth, which was a reproduction, of article that came in the Reader Rajiv Salmanic book, 1986, it gave the statistics of the increase of the percentage of major world religions from the year 1934 to 1984. In the span of 50 years, it gave the increase of the percentage of major world religion. Number one was Islam, 235%. Christianity, only 47%. Today, the fastest growing religion in America is Islam. The fastest growing religion in Europe is Islam. And that's the prophecy which has come true. As Allah says in the glorious Quran, in Surah Saf, chapter 61, verse number 9, as well as Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 33, that Allah has sent his messenger with wisdom and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other religions over all the other isms, over all the other ways of life, whether it be atheism, secularism, Marxism, communism, Westernism, Islam is destined to supersede all, master them all, overcome them all. Well, Karjil Mushrikun, however much the Mushrik don't like it, however much the idol worshippers don't like it. And the same message repeated for the third time with a different ending in Surah Fatah, chapter 48, verse number 28. That who are the Arsar al Haq, Liyuz Hila wa Ladine Kulli wa Kafabillahi Shayda. Allah has sent His Messenger with wisdom and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other isms, over all the other ways of life, whether it be Hinduism, Judaism, Christianism, Communism, Secularism, Atheism, Westernism. Islam is destined to supersede all, master them all, overcome them all. And enough is Allah as a witness. Allah is giving shahada that this religion of Islam will prevail throughout the world. I would like to end my talk by giving the translation of the verse which I started my talk with from Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse number 19, which says, Inna dina in the Islam. The only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. Wa dawan alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Thank you, Dr. Zakir. 
I'm sure you'll agree with me that you have in front of you a very exceptional person. Okay, some rules about the, the, the questions. Try to be precise uh, to the point. Try not to be, give a commentary uh, or a lecture. Um, and if you have more than one question, please ask one first and then give others a chance and then wait for your turn again. I uh, hope we'll be, we'll be fair and cooperative and um, so that I don't have to interfere much. Um, please. If you want to have written questions, you can pass to the front. Uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, my question is on polygamy. Um, according to the Quran, it is very clear that polygamy is allowed, yet there's ver there are very serious rules involved. There's serious justice involved. So when a man commits, I mean, when a man practices polygamy, he's actually putting himself on trial. Well, on the other hand, according to the statistics you have quoted for us, polygamy seems to be the only answer out to all the problems that the West is facing today due to the very high number of females involved. But let's be realistic. Every man who practices polygamy or marries even more than one wife is actually putting himself on trial. Your comments, please. The sister asked a very good question. And she said that a person can practice according to the Quran polygyny. Polygyny is more appropriate than polygamy. Polygamy includes polygyny and polyandry. Polyandry is prohibited in the Quran for reasons different which one I can tell. Polygyny is allowed. And she rightly said that if a person practices polygyny, he's putting himself to test. And that's what even we are doing, sister, here in the world. Allah says that we want to only be just pass. I want to undergo this test. We human beings were fools who took this test and we are undergoing the test. Sister asked a good question that if you marry more than one, you're undergoing a test. I do agree. If you fail the test, you'll be in problem, I do agree. But if you pass, then you get plus points also. Because polygyny has been allowed in Islam to protect the woman, but natural. And the Prophet did say that the person is best, who's best to his wife. And if he has more than one wife, he has to do justice, which is difficult. The statistics are quoted that there are millions of women throughout the world, but the ratio I haven't told you. The ratio is that for every 1,000 men in the world, there are 1,005 women. That means half percent. I mean, out of 1,000 men, five if they marry, more than one, half percent in short. Therefore, Allah hasn't made the ratio so much. He hasn't made one is to four. The women aren't four times more than the men. They're only half percent more. And many times it's a give and take. That's a few of the reasons of Polygyny, I've told you. There are various other reasons. You know, man is polygynous by nature. And suppose he has hyposexual urges, etc., which is more in man as compared to the woman. Then his option is instead of going to the marketplace, instead of going and having mistresses, the other option is having more than one wife. So for such people, it's a dual thing for himself also, as well as giving protection for the woman who require it. So Islam, alhamdulillah, is just. It's not overburdening anyone. Therefore, it's not a farther in Islam to marry more than one woman. But if you marry, and if you do justice, then inshallah, you're on the positive point. You will get sawab if you marry more than one woman and do justice. But do justice is difficult. So those people who can do and who require it, alhamdulillah, they can do it. Allah will bless them. But those who can't, it's not a farther that you should marry, neither a mustab. But if you do any act, and do it properly, Allah is surely going to bless you. Hope that's the question. Farida, I want to ask one question. As I was listening to your talk, I was, no, was very nice and everything. So I want to ask you a question. I say, I say I'm a mother who has children growing up. Uh, as you have done so well in your academics, you are a doctor and going around giving lectures and everything. To have children like you, more person like you in this world, what did your parents did you not know, to have a person like you? So you, I want you to give us some advice for mothers like me to know more details to bring up. Thank you. She <laughs> asked a very good question. That after seeing my talks, becoming a doctor and giving such talks, she asked, "What did my parents do?" And Dr. Yaya Alvi gave a very good introduction. 
and he rightly said, if I have to thank anyone in this world after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the first person is my mother. And but natural, my father and the other family members, including my wife, Alhamdulillah, after I got married, I did more dawah. It's a full family effort. People normally ask me, you know, and they tell me that, you know, that if you have to be very good, etc., you have to do family planning. Normally people say, I say, I'm the fifth child of my parents. If my parents would have done family planning, I wouldn't have been here. So I thought maybe that is the question she's going to ask. Alhamdulillah, she didn't ask that. I'm the fifth child, and Alhamdulillah, people think that having more children is a bane. But Alhamdulillah, it turns out to be a boon also, depending how you upbring them and how do you follow. Just in a nutshell, I would say that my parents, Alhamdulillah, they, they let me think freely. They didn't have any particular blinkers that, you know, follow this religiously. Alhamdulillah, my parents are religious, Alhamdulillah. They didn't force anything on me. They let me think freely. But they followed the guidance of the Quran and the Sunnah, Alhamdulillah. So because they want the Quran and Sunnah, and when a child sees that the parents are on the right, very often, Alhamdulillah, the children emulate the parent. But that's not always the case. We have instances of children or prophets going astray. It is, but Najla said, after the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whose help is most required, parents is required. And as I said, one of the reasons is, as mentioned in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number 160, that if Allah helps you, no one can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, then there is no one who can overcome you then. If Allah forsakes you, no one can help you. So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My parents put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know the amount of money they spent in making me a doctor. And my mother's desire was my son should be the best doctor. And she was wanted me to become like someone like Chris Bernard, the person with the first heart transplantation, you know, Christian Bernard from South Africa. And since my mother had met him, and that was the desire. So Alhamdulillah, even I wanted to become a doctor. And I took the medical profession because as I thought that, and it is, alhamdulillah, not that I've changed my view, that first I had the impression that doctor is the best profession to serve humanity. It is one of the good professions. So that's why I became a doctor, and my father was a doctor, a psychiatrist, and that's how, alhamdulillah, I became a doctor. But then, by being inspired by Sheikh Ahmad Didar, I got involved in dawah, and then I found that I used to find pleasure in treating the patient physically, but I got more pleasure, multiple times more, in treating the patient spiritually multiple times more. And there are thousands of doctors in the world, many, hundreds of them, who are giving free treatment. I would be another drop in the ocean. So that's the time I decided to give up my profession and turn as a full-time die, and in which my parents, they supported me. But naturally, my parents could have said, we have spent so much money on you, we had so much high hopes in you, etc. Now you have to leave the profession. Five and a half years you spend in medicine. And then, but Alhamdulillah, my parents supported me. They said, no problem, it's in the way of Allah, Alhamdulillah. I asked my mother, what would you like me to become when I wanted to give up my profession? Would you like me to become like Sheikh Ahmed Didad or like Chris Bernard? So she gave a very witting reply, I would like you to become both together. <laughs> but now when I ask her, that would you want me to become a Dai like Sheikh Didad or what I am now? Or would you want me to become like Chris Bernard? She says that one Dai like Sheikh Ahmed Didad, I can sacrifice a thousand Chris Bernard. Alhamdulillah. It was support of the parents which helps me because support of the parents and family is very important in doing dawah. How to upbring the children? I have given the talk, Islam for children, sister. Islam for children. That the best teacher for the children is the mother. And I say that the first book that the mother or the parent should give to the child is the Quran. Quran is the first book. And it will remain a guide for your children till the last day of his life. And but natural, our parents didn't know that in you know, Arabic is so important learning Arabic as a language. So I gave a talk on Al-Quran, should it be read with understanding, and showed the importance of Arabic. It's important that you should even teach your children Arabic as a language. It will help them to understand Islam better. And but natural, if anyone strives in the way of Allah, if you strive in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says in Surah an kabul chapter 29, verse 69, if you strive in his way, he will open up your pathways. So you strive, and you see to it that if you want what you want, you strive in the right way, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inshallah open up your pathways. So first is faith in Allah, second is striving, third is technique. Hope that's the question. Uh, good evening. I have a question, it's about polygamy also. If, this, um, uh, if Islam were to have a system like the zakat, why can't they have another system similar to zakat to overcome the overpopulation of female? 
Yeah, well, thank you. The brother asked the question that how does Islam have a system of zakat to overcome the poverty and crime? Why does it have a similar system for polygamy? That's what it has. In zakat, what do you do? You share your wealth. Right or wrong? In polygamy, what do you do? <laughs> the woman shares the husband. So alhamdulillah, you give a very good striking resemblance. I never thought of it before. You made me think. <laughs> you know, I learned from the question answer, therefore I love it. The more I answer the questions, the more my answers improve. Alhamdulillah. And many a times, you know, Allah gives the answers on the stage, Alhamdulillah. He gives the ilham. And more people ask me questions, the more my mind works. And Alhamdulillah, I can add to my lecture next time. That zakat is somewhat like polygamy you can compare, Alhamdulillah. It has the solution, how it has for wealth. You share your wealth. Here some women should share the husband and that solves the problem. <laughs> so, that, so that the modesty of the other woman is protected. Hope that's the question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Um, alhamdulillah, it has always, uh, you have mentioned that um, uh, the West is coming to Islam as promised by Allah in the Quran. And uh, also the, the embracing of Islam by, by uh, non-believers were because of hikmah that was given by Allah. But I just want to know, in the West, despite the fact that Islam has been um, adulterated and condemned, and the behavior of some Muslims were, were not Islamic, what is it that, that, that intrigues the, the non-Muslims to learn more about Islam? Is it the behavior of some Muslims? Is it the contribution of da'i in the West? Or what exactly it is? I mean, uh, uh, putting aside the, the hidayah that Allah has given these uh, people. The sister asked a very good question, that in spite of the media, the Western world is against Islam, how come Westerners are yet, alhamdulillah, accepting Islam? Uh, because, but naturally, hidayah is important, she rightly said that's the most important. Is it because da'is are going around? Is it because they're looking at the Muslims in the West and they're accepting Islam? Or is it something else? Sister rightly said, first is the hidayah. And I wouldn't say that looking at the Muslims, all the Westerners would accept Islam. Like Brother Yusuf Islam said, that it is good that I read the Quran first before meeting the Muslims. If I had met the Muslims, I wouldn't have accepted Islam. That's his view. That's his view. Maybe the Muslims he met weren't that good. But there are many people in the world who accept Islam only by looking at the Muslim. Therefore, what I say normally in my talk, People say, oh, Islam talks such good things, but you're Muslim, some people are cheating, they are bribing, they are doing wrong things. So what I tell them, that there are black sheep in every community. There are black sheep in every community, you know, that we have Muslims who cheat, who bribe, who deal in drugs. Many Muslims who I know can drink the non-Muslim under the table. You know, they're expert in drinking. The media, what they do, they pick up these black sheep and they project as exemplary Muslim. They pick up the black sheep, and they portray as exemplary Muslim. As though every Muslim is a cheat, every Muslim is a drunkard, every Muslim does wrong things. It's the main fault of the media. They're doing it for their own reasons, so that they fill the coffers. So I tell them that on a whole, Muslims, alhamdulillah, we are the biggest community of teetotalers who don't imbibe alcohol. We're the community which gives the maximum charity. No non-Muslim can show us a candle where sobriety is concerned, where modesty is concerned, where humanity is concerned, where ethics is concerned. Western media picks up black sheep and projects them as samples. So what I give the example, that suppose if you want to judge a car, suppose a new model of Mercedes-Benz is there in the market, I don't know which is the new model, maybe E230 of 1998 or whatever it is, and you want to judge how good the car is. You let a person drive the Mercedes car, who doesn't know how to drive, and he bangs up the car. Who will you blame? Will you blame the car or will you blame the driver? Who will you blame? The driver. So if you want to judge the car, don't look at Islam by its followers. The best exemplary Muslim is a beloved Prophet Muhammad Best exemplary Muslim. So sister, some people by looking at Muslims may go away from Islam. Some people may come closer. Therefore the right way is to judge the authentic sources. And though the media, is against Islam, as the sister rightly said. You have people like Sanman Rashdi writing books, satanic courses. Those who have read, they know what the book is about. So I say, Alhamdulillah, it's Allah's will. 
Whatever happens, happens for good. Alhamdulillah. Though he slandered the Prophet, his wives, knows Billah. Yet, there are hundreds of people who accepted Islam only because of Salman Rushdie's book. Alhamdulillah. Allah has his ways. He can even let the devil do his job. He has his ways, Alhamdulillah. So he has his ways, how he does the job. Many people only became Muslims because of Salman Rushdie. And those who are away from Islam, maybe it's in them. That's a different thing. But the amount of, you know, people did more research. You know, people said he's wrong, that said this, that. Whether it's right or wrong, you can refer to my video cassette. I've given death penalties right or wrong. But when people started having different opinion, when the Westerners, when they want to form their own opinion, they do research. And when they did research of the lifestyle of the beloved Prophet, Alhamdulillah, they accepted Islam. You know, the Western world, as I said, the maximum which they criticize in Islam is the women's rights in Islam. I've given a talk on women's rights in Islam, modernizing outdated, clarifying the misconception. And do you know today, amongst the Westerners, more women are accepting Islam than men? If Islam subjugates the women, how come more Westerner women are accepting Islam than the men? You know why? Because when they do research, and some people do research for speaking against Islam, for example, Gary Miller, you know, Gary Miller, one of the rewards, Dr. Ahad Umar, he was given the Quran to take out mistakes. And he tried to take out mistakes. He couldn't. He accepted Islam. So there are many people who write to criticize Islam. They read. And then they realize the truth is something else. So different people, Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives them hidayah in a different way. Some people look at Muslim and they accept Islam. Some people do research and accept Islam. Some people to attack Islam, they take a step. And one of the best supporters of Islam, Hadha Tumar, may Allah be pleased with him. He was one of the staunchest enemy before. A prophet prayed that among the two Umars, may Allah be pleased with one of them. May Allah let one accept Islam and Alhamdulillah. So the different reasons and different things, many people's problems are solved. Regarding dies doing the job, I don't think so. Believe me, we aren't doing our job. We as a Muslim, we aren't doing our job. In fact, Islam is a religion which is a missionary religion. Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 110, O oh, Muslims, we are the best of people evolved for mankind. Because we enjoy what is good, and we forbid what is wrong, and we believe in Allah. Allah calls us the best of people, because we are supposed to enjoy what is good, and forbid what is wrong, and believe in Allah. Every Muslim is supposed to be a dai. If not a full-time dai, at least a part-time dai. How many dais do we have full-time? in the world. You can count them on your fingertips. It's a shame on the Muslim Ummah. But Allah has given a promise by which I ended my talk. Surah Saf chapter 51 verse 9, Surah Tawbah chapter 9 verse 33, and Surah Fatah chapter 48 verse 28, that Islam will prevail over all the other ways of life. With or without you, with or without me. The rubbish that we are. Allah doesn't require you and me to make his deen prevail in the world or in the West. The rubbish that we are. Allah doesn't require us. Allah is giving us an opportunity to do a profit job and to earn a profit's reward. Make hay while the sun is shining. Believe me, we are not doing our job. We Muslims, as a whole, we should be people who do maximum dawah. But the Christians, we know them. 60,000 Christian missionaries, crusaders, raising the dust throughout the world full time. And hundreds of thousands more who are supporting them. How many Muslims do we have as full-time dais? How many? It's a shame on us. But Allah, with or without you, with or without me, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Muhammad, chapter 47, verse 38, وَإِن تَتَوَلَّوْ يَسْتَبْ بِالْقَوْمُنْ غَيْرَكُمْ سُمَّا لَا يُكُنْ أَمْسَالَكُمْ If you do not do the job, Allah will substitute in your place another people. سُمَّا لَا يُكُنْ أَمْسَالَكُمْ And they will not be like you. You know, we think, oh, we have got the key to heaven, to Jannah. If you don't do the job, Allah will substitute in your place another people. Summa like in Amsalakum and they will not be like you. We think, you know, Westerners, they are so bad. Allah may make them the torch bearers tomorrow. Allah will substitute you if you do not do the job. Allah will substitute us if you do not do the job. Allah doesn't require you and me to do the job, the rubbish that we are. He's giving us an opportunity to do a profit job and to earn a profit's reward. So where that is a concern, I would say that we are far below even the passing level. As the ummah, as a whole, we are not doing the job.
There are few people, Alhamdulillah, Shaykh Didad, Alhamdulillah, may Allah give them more life and health. But as a whole, we have very few Muslim dies. So sister, I wouldn't say that Dawah is doing the job. Allah is doing it through his own ways, through his thing. If, if we would follow the Quran, then there would be many more, hundreds and millions of more die. That's what required. Hope that answers the question. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Thank you, the, our current speaker, for this very genuine and educative lecture you have given us. Uh, my question is, in fact, the first part of the question is already asked by the sister, and you have answered it. That is the role of Muslims as to the topic, as how the Western are reverting to Islam. I was waiting when you were giving the roles of the, the reasons why they are reverting to Islam. I was waiting for you to mention that there are also Muslims who are playing the game, but I waited all in vain. And that's why I was coming here to ask you about the role of Muslims. What are we really doing in order to make those people revert to Islam? So you have answered that one maybe, and maybe you will shed more light on it. Now, uh, the second part of the question is, <clears throat> taking the West as such, Sometimes for me it becomes very difficult, very hard, so much so that there are some of them there who do not believe in scriptures. They don't have scriptures, manuscripts, and so on. So it becomes very difficult for me to deal with such a people, to convince them and make them revert. Only very few people of your caliber maybe can succeed in doing that. So what can we do, actually, in this field? And on top of that, uh, I attended your talk there in UIA. You mentioned that there are also some in the East, that is in India, who have claimed divinity. Uh, there are a multitude of them there. So those ones, how can we deal with them? They don't have the scripture, not only don't have the scripture, but again, they are the one to reveal, to give us the scriptures, because they are gods. So how can you convince God to, 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 to believe in another God? Thank you. So there are basically three questions. The first one is about Dawah, that what is the role of the Muslims in spreading Islam? Secondly, how can you convince those who don't believe in scriptures talking about atheists? And thirdly, those who claim to be God, like in India, how can you tell a God about, about the scriptures? The first part I already answered, just addition. When I said that Muslims aren't doing up to the level, that doesn't mean Muslims aren't doing any job. There are Muslim organizations in the Western world. There are good organizations like Isna, Ikna, Alhamdulillah, they're doing the job. But not what they should, not that that organization, Muslim as a whole, what they should be doing, they aren't doing. Not that only Westerners should do the job. Muslims throughout the Ummah should do the job. I'm not only blaming the Muslims in America, etc. Muslim as a whole Ummah should do the job. So as a Ummah as a whole, we aren't doing up to the level which we should do. But there are good organizations also. I've been to the West several times. Brother Yusuf Islam, he has a wonderful school. One of the best Islamic schools that I've been to. Islamic Foundation in Leicester. Isna is in USA. Islamic Society for North America, ICNA is the Islamic Circle for North America. Alhamdulillah, there are organizations. But not what we should do up to the level. There should be many more, not just a few handful. Regarding the second question, how can we convince those people who don't have scriptures? And third is, who make scriptures with their own hands? Who don't have scriptures, like who don't believe in God, like atheists? Whether us, how can we convince? If a person has scripture, like Bible, Christians, Hindus, Vedas, we can talk about the scripture. How can you convince an atheist? If you were there for my talk today afternoon, brother, I told you the master key was what? Sulay al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 64, which says, Ta'ala wila kalmitin sawa'im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. The master key for Dawa is, come to common terms as between us and you. So brother asked that, how will we talk to an atheist? Are there any common terms between atheists? Are there any common terms? How will we speak to an atheist? 
When I meet an atheist, the first thing I do is I congratulate him. I congratulate an atheist. You may ask that why is Brother Zakir congratulating an atheist? I congratulate him because he is a Christian, because father is a Christian. That person is a Hindu, because father is a Hindu. Many Muslims are because fathers are Muslims. This atheist is thinking that he's coming from a religious background, maybe a Christian or a Hindu background. If he's coming from a Hindu background, one god is fighting with another god. The god's wife is taken away and the god takes 12 years to save his wife. How long will he take to save me if I'm in problem? And god is crucified on the cross. So he starts thinking, how can we believe in such god? So he doesn't believe in god. I congratulate him, you know why? Because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha, there is no God. <laughs> what I have to do is prove to him, Illallah, which I shall do, inshallah. So half my job is done with the Hindu and the Christian. First, I have to tell him, the God that you're worshipping is wrong. And then put the correct concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, half my job is done. He already agrees there is no God. So my job is easy, so I congratulate him. La ilaha, there is no God. But then you should prove it, Allah, which I shall do, inshallah. And there are various techniques showed in my cassette. Is the Quran God's word, Quran modern science, how to do it? I'll just tell you in brief. I'll ask him the first thing that suppose if you have an object, a machinery, which no one in the world has seen, if I tell that it's yes, it's brought to you for the first time in front of you. This machinery, this object, no one in the world has seen. No one. First time it's brought in front of you. Who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this object? Can you guess? Who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this object? Can anyone make any guess? The maker. Any other guess? The creator. The person who makes this. Whatever answer the atheist will give, will tell you the maker, or the creator, or the manufacturer, or the producer, somewhat similar. Keep it in your mind. The first person who will tell you the mechanism of object which no one has seen in the world is the creator or maker or the manufacturer. Now you ask him, how did the universe come into existence? So he will tell you that today science has told us that initially there was one primary nebula. Then there was secondary separation. There was a big bang which gave rise to galaxies, planets, and the present earth we live in. Talking about the big bang theory. That's how the universe came into existence. So you tell him, but this is already mentioned in the Quran. 1400 years ago in Surah Al Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam yaral lazina kafru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Kaan atarat kam sakna huma. That the heaven and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. Who could have mentioned about this big bang theory you're talking about, which was discovered yesterday in science? Yesterday means 30 years back, 100 years back. Quran mentions 14 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? So he will tell you, you know, maybe it's a flow. Don't argue with him. Next part. You ask him, the, what was the initial state of the celestial matter before the universe was created? He will tell you, it is gas. You tell him, this book, the Quran says in Surah Fusila, chapter 41, verse number 11, that it was dukhan, it was smoke. So you ask him, is it right or wrong? He will tell you that smoke is more appropriate than gas, if you know the science well. You ask him, what is the shape of the earth? He will tell you, it is spherical. So you ask him, when did you discover this, if you know the science well? He will tell you, in 1577, Sir Francis Drake was the first person who sailed around the earth. You tell him, Quran says in Surah Naziyat, chapter 79, verse number 30, Wal ard abad azalika dhaha. And thereafter, we have made the earth X-shaped, referring to the egg of an ostrich, which is not round like a ball. You tell him, the Quran says the earth is not round like a ball. It is flattened from the top and bulging from the center. He says, yes, yes, that's more correct. It is geospherical. So you are telling it is round, Quran said it's geospherical 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? Ah, your prophet who wrote the Quran. He's an intelligent person. No, you may say something. Don't argue. The light of the moon, its own light or reflected light, he will tell you reflected. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 61. I was taught in school, the sun was stationary, it didn't rotate about its axis. Quran says in Surah Al Ambiya, chapter 21, verse number 33, Who al ladi khalaqa layl wa nahara? That it is Allah who has created the night and the day. Wa wal kamar, the sun and the moon. Kullun fi falaki yasbahun, each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. Quran says the sun revolves and rotates. In school, I didn't learn that. I was taught it didn't rotate about its axis. It was stationary. He will tell you, no, latest discovery in science tells us that the sun also rotates and it takes about 25 days to complete one rotation. Who could have mentioned the Quran? Ask him. He will pause. Like that. 
Quran speaks about biology. Every living thing made from water. Who could have written that? Quran speaks about water cycle. How the water rise, falls, storm, the clouds, clouds move in the interior, water falls down, and the water cycle is completed. Quran speaks about salt and sweet water. There are two types of water, salt and sweet water. Between them, the barrier which is forbidden to be trespassed. Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 53, and Surah Rahman, chapter 55, verse 19 to 20. Quran speaks about geology, that we have made the earth as an expanse, was Jibala Autada, and the mountain that takes. Surah Naba, chapter 78, verse 6 and 7. Who could have mentioned that? Keep on asking. And the only answer he can give you, it can't be by fluke, because the theory of probability. You tell them a theory of probability that the chances that if it's a fluke, for example, if I toss a coin, the chances that I'll be right is one out of two. It can either be heads or tails. And if I make a fluke, guess, the chance that I'll be right is half, one upon two. If I toss a coin twice, the chances I'll be right both the time is half into half is one upon four, it's 25%. If I toss a coin thrice, chances I'll be right all three times is 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 2 is 1 upon 8. It's 12 and a half percent. Similarly, if you use this probability theory to the Quran, that what are the possible shapes a person can think of for the earth? A person can think of about 30 shapes. It can be square, it can be flat, it can be quadrangle, it can be rectangle, it can be triangle, it can be spherical, 30 shapes. The chances if someone makes a wild guess, it's correct is, one out of 30. Light of moon can be own light or reflected light. Chances someone makes a guess it's correct is one upon two. Chances both are correct is one upon 30 into one upon two is one upon 60. If a person wants to make a guess, everything is created of what? In the deserts of Arabia, a person will first think of sand, of wood, of some other metal, aluminium, maybe iron, and maybe a person can think of 10,000 things which living creatures can be made of. Chances that he makes a wild guess, and it's correct, is 1 upon 10,000. Chances that all three are correct is 1 upon 13 to 1 upon 2 into 1 upon 10,000 is 1 upon 60,000. If you calculate, 0.000017 is 0.017%. In three things, it has come to 0.017%. If you put up all, Quran speaks about 1,000 verses about science. And mathematics tells us if 0 0.00, if there are 50 zeros, it is equivalent to zero. So chances that it's a wild guess is zero. Who could have written that? He will tell you. Creator, maker, manufacturer. This creator we call as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I just told in short, for more details, refer to my video cassette, is the Quran God's word. Various techniques, various techniques to prove the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Third question by the post is, how can you prove to a God that what is scriptures are wrong, etc. In my talk, I gave you a litmus test for theology, Surah class. Chapter number 112, verse 1 to 4. So you tell him that if you are God, do you pass the test? Suppose someone says that this is a gold jewelry. I want to sell it to you. 24 karat gold. What will you do? Will you buy it? Will you buy it? You will say, first I'll check up whether it's true or not. You will check it with a touchstone. You'll go to a jeweler and say, see, there's a man who wants to sell me this jewelry. And he's telling it is 24 karat gold. You'll go to a jeweler. He will take your jewelry and rub it against the touchstone, and it'll match the color. If it matches the 24 carat, he'll say 24 carat. If it matches the 22 carat, he will say 22 carat. If 18 carat, he will tell you 18 carat. It may not be gold at all, because all that glitters is not gold. So example of Rajnish which I gave, use Rajnish, for example Rajnish, he's the almighty God, put him to test of Surah class. Kul fallahuad, Allahu samad, lam yilad, lam yilad, lam yukul Let's put to test that say he's Allah one and only. Is Rajnish one and only? Or anyone, any, anyone who claims to be God, whether it be Jesus, whether it be, Pony, whether it be Ram, Lakshman, anyone you put to test. Normally use a hikmah, I don't use the main God, otherwise they'll feel insulted. Like Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 108, revile not those whom they worship God besides Allah, lest in the ignorance they will revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So to these people who say that they are gods, you check them out with the touchstone Surah class. And you can prove that they aren't God. So if they aren't God, the scripture being right is out of the question at all. Hope that answers the question. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. I have a clarification to make. I, the hadith that you mentioned about marriage being half the deen, 
I just wanted to know, is it getting married completes half your deen, or the entire process of marriage, how you deal with marriage, how you deal with your husband or wife, the whole marriage, right from you get married to the rest of your life, or just the fact that you got married, it's half done. Sister asked a very good question. That the hadith that marriage completes half your deen, does it mean that only marriage completes half your deen, or the whole process, etc.? Sister, as I mentioned, that when the Prophet said marriage completes half your deen, he meant that marriage promises from promiscuity, from fornication, from adultery, after that. Marriage is a full process, various hadith. The beloved Prophet said that when you marry, you normally look for four things. Wealth, beauty, nobility, and virtue. Now, when you marry, people look, the girl is beautiful, or the boy is handsome, how wealthy he or she is, which family, Sheikh family, Sayyid family, noble family. And last is virtue. Prophet said, the most important of all these four is virtue. So when you get married, the whole process itself, you look for a virtuous wife or a virtuous husband. How you get married, our beloved Prophet said, the best marriage is that in which the least expense is made. We have marriage in the Muslim Ummah in many countries. They spend hundreds and thousands of dollars and ringgits also maybe, yes? Several. They spend excessively. Quran says in Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse 25, 26, that if you're a spendthrift, you're the brother of the devil. So choosing a life partner, how to get married, in simplicity, in sunnah, all this. Then how you upbring your children. After marriage, be loyal to your wife. Not that after marriage you go and do adultery, yet you're completing half your deen. The Prophet said, the best of you is he who is the best to his wife. How you treat your wife. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 19, treat your wife with equity and kindness even if you dislike her. Even if you dislike your wife, the Quran says, treat her with equity and kindness. People give dowry in the Eastern world in India from the woman. In Islam, you have to give maher. If you get married, then you have to be like a good husband. After you get married, you have children, you have to be like a good father or a good mother. All this process in total, which is related with marriage. If you do all of these, these constitute half the deen. To be a good mother, to be a good father, to be a good husband, to be a good wife, not to be extravagant. All these process, to abstain from adultery, homosexuality, promiscuity, all these nearly constitute half the teachings of Islam. Therefore, beloved Prophet said, marriage completes half your deen, means you marry and follow Islam in all those aspects. Inshallah, half your deen will be complete. From that question. Assalamu alaikum. Um, okay, I, you were just talking about the Westerners just now, right? And I am a convert or revert in your words. Um, and before I converted, I had a very bad picture about Islam. I mean, I, I sorry to say, but I hated Islam. And the reason was because, like you said, because of the Muslims that I had dealt with. I mean, I, I feel that since we are talking about how to, you know, do the da'wah to non-Muslims, it's very difficult even for me to even talk to my family because of the picture that we portray to them. I think that it's, if you're talking about Islam itself, okay, fine, it's, it's very, very good religion. It is the only true religion. But don't you think it's wrong to always criticize other religions? I mean, that approach is like really wrong. I mean, we criticize Westerners so much. We do that. I mean, whatever you said about rapes and all those things, it occurs in Muslim countries. I mean, Middle Eastern countries, it might not be reported that much, but it goes on. So why do we always pick on them? And the other, the other thing is that about women, you were saying that non-Muslims say that Islam such subjugates women because there are so many things in the Quran that you know refers to males and females, but somehow it, whatever that refers to males is just ignored, and everything that you know refers to females is pressed so hard. Like you were just saying that virtuous husband and wife, but no, I mean I've only heard it when I've read all the books. It's like oh, you're supposed to get you know virtuous wife and. No, no, I mean, everything is towards to women only. So why do we do that? It's very difficult to convince a non-Muslim because we do that. And one more example is, you know, that I, I was told that uh, Rasulullah had, you know, like he gave equal hand in helping his wife in housework and all those things. But why, don't, why do we only have books on how to be a good wife? Why don't we ever have lectures or anything on how to be a good husband? You know, like nothing, everything is only pressed on women. Women are supposed to be doing this, doing that. That's not what the religion says. So maybe that's the reason why we are putting off non-Muslims. Sister asked a very good question. Very relevant. She said that, Alhamdulillah, she's a reward. I'd like to congratulate her. 
Alhamdulillah. And she said that she had a very wrong picture of Muslims before, and I didn't say in my talk that many people, when they look at Muslims, they would never like to become a Muslim. I said that in my talk. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave her hidayat and she accepted Islam. And she said that the talk was based on how to talk to the West. The talk was why the West is coming to Islam. It wasn't based on how to dawah to West. I've got other cassettes dealing with that. I've got a cassette on misconception about Islam. How specifically to do dawah amongst the West is a different technique. Today my talk was not how to dawah. It was the reason why West is accepting Islam and I'm calling a spade a spade. And you said, sister, very rightly that you should not criticize other religion. Quran says that in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse 108. Revile not those whom they worship God besides Allah, lest in the ignorance they will revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the Quran also says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81 and 82, وَقُلْ جَعَ الْحَقُّ وَزَاقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ لَبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوكَ That means truth is heard again, falsehood, falsehood perishes. For its nature, falsehood is bound to perish. You said that I was criticizing the Western world and talking about the X, Y, Z. Sister, criticizing means actually what I would say that without any proof. What I was quoting is statistics of America. So if Americans want to criticize America, and if I'm quoting them, then why are you blaming me? Criticizing means what? You know, actually what I would say, that picking up points and twisting them, like the Westerners do. I'm sorry, I'm blaming them again, but that's a fact. <laughs> I have to call a spade a spade. And the Westerners love calling a spade a spade, and they are proud to call a spade a spade. They say, no, we are bold, we are truthful. Alhamdulillah, even I'm truthful. It may not go down their throat, that's a different thing. They showed in the media the women are subjugated, etc. And I've given a talk on that to clarify. So sister, what I was doing, I was quoting FBI report, written not by Muslims, by the Westerners, quoting statistics of rape, not by Muslims, by non-Muslim Westerners, about adultery, about incest. I'm only quoting their statistics. And when I quote to them, they cannot say Zakir is criticizing because you know why I'm quoting from their statistics. If I say, ha, ah, Mr. Ahmad Ali said this, so they say, okay, this one is pulling a fast one. I'm not quoting Ahmad Ali or Sultan Bhai, I'm quoting their statistics. So therefore, I'm using my Hikmah sister. And besides, they're saying that even rape takes place in other countries, it's not reported. Sister, I would have to disagree with you. Rape takes more in the Western country, it's not reported there. You know, it is so common. Rape is so common, it's not worth reporting. I've been to West, hardly I read any cases of rape. It is so common, it's a day-to-day -day life. It's not reported, sister. If it's reported in news brief, if a rape takes place in other countries, headlines. It does take, not that it doesn't take place. It takes place throughout the world. Least rape is where? You're talking Muslim countries? It does take. Those Muslim countries who do not follow the Islamic law, it takes place. So the least rate of rape is in which country, sister? Which country? Least rape in the world. It's in Saudi Arabia. Least rape. It may be taking place there also. I'm not saying it is nil. There are black sheep in the community throughout the world. But the least rate of rape in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. The least rate of robbery in any country in the world, it's in Saudi Arabia. Yes, there may be other Muslim countries who don't follow Islam. So they are pseudo-Muslims. Regarding reporting, if it takes place in other countries that comes in headlines because rape is something which is a stigma. In America, it's a lifestyle. Like as the doctor said, if a patient comes, I have a weedy doctor says, and I have. So nothing great. They, they are shameless. According to me, they are shameless. According to them, it's fine. So sister, when I'm calling a spade a spade, I have to call it. I use the best words, public property, but that's a fact. So people may say, I criticize, but I have to call a spade a spade. And that's the reason the Westerners like it, alhamdulillah. So regarding your first thing that I'm criticizing them, I'm quoting the statistics. Like for example, the Quran says, do thou with hikmah, udu ila sabi rabbika bilikmah wal mawzit al hasna, wajad al umbilati ahsan. Invite all to the way of the Lord with wisdom and brief preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. Beloved Prophet said to the Christians, wala taqulu salasa, Quran says that when you tell a Christian, do not say trinity, this is stop it, it's better for you. Even if you say it in the best form, he's bound to feel hurt. See, when you take out the faults of a person, the best way you say he's bound to feel hurt. When I tell a Christian, why do you worship Jesus Christ? Even if I say with love and care, he's bound to feel hurt. So I have to say in the best way, which is acceptable, but he's bound to feel hurt. Not that I'm going out of the way to insult them. I'm giving the statistics. That was regarding your second part. Regarding a third part that 
why do Muslim scholars and speakers speak about women, women only picking up verses of the women and not talking about what rights men have to do? Sister, I think you should see my cassette. Women's rights in Islam. And after I give that talk, people say, when are you going to give a talk, men's rights in Islam? And in that cassette, I say what the husband should do to the wife. And even today, if you heard me, when I talked about hijab, I made the same statement which you made. That normally Muslim speakers, they speak about hijab for the woman, but Allah speaks first of the hijab for the man. So why the other people do that, you have to go and ask them. I cannot answer on their behalf. So if you want to see a neutral approach, Alhamdulillah of Islam, you can hear my video cassettes. And there you'll find even in my women's rights in Islam, I've spoken how a husband should behave to the wife. More of that. Educating even the men. And many men, they don't like it. And they say, now when will you give a talk on men's rights in Islam? So sister, I've given talks. Alhamdulillah, Islam believes in equality between men and women. But equality doesn't mean identicality. Men and women are equal, but they aren't identical. And if you hear my talk, I've spoken about spiritual rights of the women, of social rights, I've spoken about economic rights, about legal rights, about political rights, about educational rights. Alhamdulillah, I'm trying to explain that Alhamdulillah, Islam believes in equality between men and women. Equality doesn't mean identicality. If you compare to the Western world, again, giving statistics, quoting what they believe, the Western talk of women's liberalization is nothing but a disguised form of exploitation of a body, degradation of honor, and depriving her soul. The Western society claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her to a status of concubine, of mistresses, of society butterflies, which are mere tools in the hands of pleasure seekers and sex marketers, which are hidden behind the colorful screen of art and culture. The Western world claiming to uplift the woman have actually degraded her. It talks about Oh, we want to uplift the woman, etc. What are they doing? Surely many of you may have gone to the Western world. It's only in the name of art and culture. It's a colorful screen. But behind them, you know what's happening. They want to change the role. They want to say, man can do this, even woman can do this. Men and women are equal, but they aren't identical. Men and women are different in physiology. They're different biologically. What everything the man does, the woman cannot do. Everything the woman does, the man cannot do. Tomorrow we cannot say, okay, even I want to give birth to a child. I cannot give. I'm different. And do you know in Islam, the status, I'll just quote a couple of examples. I've given my talk. In Islam, where love is concerned and companionship for the parents, our beloved Prophet said in Sahih Bukhari, volume number eight, in the book of Adab, chapter number two, hadith number two, once a person came to the Prophet and said, who deserves the maximum love and companionship in this world? So the Prophet said, your mother. The man asked, who next? The Prophet said, your mother. The man asked, after that, who? The Prophet said, for the third time, your mother. The man asked, after that, who? The fourth time, the Prophet said, your father. That means 75% of love and companionship, three-fourths of the love and companionship goes to the mother. The remaining 25%, one-fourth of love and companionship goes to the father. In short, mother gets a gold medal. Mother gets a silver medal. She also gets a bronze medal. The father has to be satisfied with a mere consolation prize. <laughs> See, these are the teachings of Islam. This is what the Prophet taught us. I cannot say, oh, mother gets so much respect, so I also want to give birth to a child. I can't. So men and women, as I said, are overall equal, but they aren't identical. For example, if in a classroom, there are two students, A and B, both of them get 80 out of 100. Both come out first. But if you analyze the question paper, the question paper has got 10 questions, each carrying 10 marks. In answer to question number one, student A gets 9 out of 10. So student A is 9 out of 10, and student B gets 7 out of 10. So in question one, A has a degree of advantage than student B. In question two, B gets 9 out of 10, A gets 7 out of 10. So in question two, B has a degree of advantage. In the remaining eight questions, both get 8 out of 10. So overall, if you add up, both get 80 out of 100. Both are equal. But in question number one, A has a degree of advantage than B. In question two, B has a degree of advantage than A. So men and women are equal, but they're identical. Suppose a robber comes into my house, comes to rob. I cannot say, I believe in women's lip. I believe in equality in women. I won't tell my wife or my sister to go and fight. <laughs> so Allah says in Surah Nisa, 
chapter number 4, verse number 34, 35, that Allah has given more strength to the men. So men have a degree of advantage when it comes to physical strength. So it's he who should protect the women. So in strength, men have a degree of advantage. As I give another example, in companionship, the mother gets more respect than father. So in some aspects, men have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, women have a degree of advantage. Overall, men and women are equal. As you rightly said, sister, if you read the teaching of Islam, they are, alhamdulillah, very good. Don't judge Islam by the followers. If you want to judge, judge by what our beloved Prophet Muhammad said. So what you should do, sister, if you said that there aren't Islamic books, etc., talking about what husbands should do, etc., inshallah, you do research and you give talks. Alhamdulillah, I mean, inshallah, Allah will help you. And you will be more effective because you're being a revert. And when a revert speak, it has more effect. Alhamdulillah. So the thing is that, sister, I do agree there are black sheep in a community. What we should do, we should pick up the good points. And we have even good people, alhamdulillah. Overall, more of them are good than bad. We have to set exemplary of the good people. And the best example is the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And inshallah, for a more neutral view, as you said that people, the speakers will talk about women, women should do this, women should do that. I'd request you watch my cassette, and then inshallah, you will change. Hope that's the best. Hello. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dr. Zakir, I try to understand earlier, actually uh, mentioned about Western leader uh, afraid of Islam. You see, even uh, during Jahiliyyah, the leaders of Jahiliyyah are not afraid of Islam, and that is the why they fight Islam. They are more afraid that when they say uh, when they say the Shahada, they know that they have to change. I mean, most of the leader of the world cannot accept the change. So, uh, most probably, why the leaders of the West or any leaders of the world is afraid to to is accept Islam is because they cannot accept the change. And I think the biggest change is they have to step down and also uh, those leaders, they have to, uh, in a way, give to a better Muslim, although it's in America or anywhere in the world. So let us pose the question that why should the Western leaders be afraid of Islam? And the leaders of Jahiliya, they weren't afraid of Islam. I'm sorry, brother. I fail to disagree with you. I'm sorry, I disagree with you. The leaders of the pagan leader at the time of the Prophet, they were really afraid of Islam. The only thing they were afraid of was Islam. Therefore, they told the Prophet that we will make you the king of Arabia if you give up this message of monotheism. We will make you the richest man in the world. The Prophet gave the reply, even if you place the sun in my right hand and the moon in my left, I will not give up this message of Islam. The leaders were afraid. You know why were they afraid? That there are 330 gods which they will have to barter for one god. Who will come to Mecca? Who will come to Mecca and buy all these other things in which they sell in the name of idol worship? Leaders were very scared. Later on, Alhamdulillah, truth had to prevail. They didn't accept Islam. Therefore, the Quran says, target the leaders of Kuffars. Quran says, target the leaders of Kuffars. Target them. If they accept, thousands will follow. So therefore, I said, most of the leaders of Western world are afraid. Not all. We have good people also speaking good things about Islam. Some leaders, like Prince Charles, said some few good words. His Nia, Allah knows best. I don't doubt anyone's Nia. Some minister of, of UK now spoke some good things about Islam. So, brother, as I said, the leaders are afraid. You know why? You said it's so easy they have to accept Islam. It is not that easy, brother. Easy from our point of view. From their point of view, difficult. Why? If they accept Islam, who will fill their coffers? You understand? That if the leaders of Quraysh at that time, Abu Sufyan, I mean, the other leaders, they were rich. They were the richest man. If they accept Islam, who will bow down to them? Because in Islam, all the human beings are equal. He will have to embrace the slave. He'll have to change his lifestyle. They were afraid they'll have to change their lifestyle. Similarly, here, if they accept Islam, all the human beings are like one brotherhood, alhamdulillah. So leaders are afraid that they will have to come down from their status. 
in which they are living in an ivory tower. Leaders are afraid that they'll have to give all these things just to barter for Islam. But finally, when Allah gives hidayah, they prefer having a mansion in the Akhirah than a mansion here. As the best example I can give you again is of a lady, Quran says, of Asya. May Allah be pleased with her. It's mentioned in Surah Tahrim, chapter number 66, verse number 11, that she prayed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that please make mansion for myself in the Jannah in exchange for the luxury in this world. She was the wife of the most powerful, supposed to be most powerful man in the world, Pharaoh. But yes, she prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I would like to barter all these riches, etc., for a mansion in the Akhirah, in the Jannah. So Alhamdulillah, when Allah gives Hidayah, let him be the biggest leader. He accepts Islam for the Akhirah. Hope that answers the question. Um, on coming back to the equality of men and women in Islam, we are told in the Quran, of course, that men and women are equal in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is also, um, I mean, the rights of women are backed up by the hadith of the Prophet, where the mother is much more important than the father in terms of respect. But then, in the Aqiqah ceremonies, you're required to just slaughter one goat for the daughter and two for the son, somewhat indicating that the son is more important. The sister posed the question that why during Aqiqah are two goats slaughtered for the son and one goat for the daughter? Sister, there are several say hadith saying that you can even slaughter one goat for your son. It's not compulsory. That's say hadith. One goat for daughter and two goats for the son. You can slaughter even one goat for the son. It's not that you should slaughter two goats for the son. But what I can think of the reason is that because man in Islam is the bread earner, man in Islam is the bread earner, that before a woman is married, it's the duty of the father or the brother, and after she's married, it's the duty of the husband and the son to look after her lodging, boarding, clothing, and all financial aspects. So here, alhamdulillah, she is free from financial obligations. She is overprotected, alhamdulillah. So, but naturally, according to my logic, I'm not saying this is the reason, Allah walam. Allah knows the best reason why two goats for, for a son, but that's not only the case. Maybe because he's financially more strong. Therefore, a person is required to spend more money because of a son. That may be one of the reasons, Allah knows the best. But compulsory two goats for one son is not in Sahih Hadith. Sahih Hadith gives you the option, either one or two. And for the woman, one, no problem. If you wish, if you want to slaughter more, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our beloved Prophet gave you the option. Hope that's the question. Assalamu alaikum. Doctor, just you mentioned that in the early days, it was stated that we should target the kuffar, the leaders of the kuffar. <coughs> Alhamdulillah, the pre present state of Muslim Ummah, as far as the quantity is concerned, almost every fourth uh, person in this world is a Muslim. And every third country is a Muslim country. So, what I feel that presently what we lack is the leadership of the Muslim Ummah. Am I right to say that we should target the leaders of the different states? The brother asked a good question that Alhamdulillah Islam has spread throughout the world and According to him, 25% are Muslims, every fourth person, and every third country is a Muslim country. But we lack leadership. Shouldn't we have a Muslim leader and target the leader of the Muslim country? I do agree with you, brother. You should even target the kuffar, but I do agree with you that you should have a leader. Islam believes in leadership. Islam believes in Amir. Unfortunately, the Khilafah was abolished. Last it was in Turkey, by the Westerners again. It should be reformed, that Khilafah should be there. Islam believes in Khilafah, and we should have a Khalifa. There are groups which are striving the level best to again have the system of Khilafat. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give them strength and hidayah. 
and they are doing the job there are people who are trying to convince leaders of various countries especially the muslim countries and they are trying the level best and we pray that may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala let a leader emerge amongst the muslim ummah so that he can guide with a leader alhamdulillah we can do wonders so islam is for leaders so i do agree we should try and find a good leader who follows the quran and the sunnah unfortunately most of the today's political leaders of muslim countries most of them they don't fit the criteria of the quran and the sunnah so people are trying who will be the best inshallah may allah help a leader to emerge but simultaneously while they are finding leaders for the muslim ummah and when leaders try to emerge the non muslim try and put them down they are trying their way so we should try and find a leader simultaneously even follow the other guidance of the quran that we should target the kuffar so both should be done simultaneously but i do agree with you that there should be a leader among the muslim community thank you very much for your patience and your cooperation uh, and your um, time spent here and uh, our most uh, utmost thanks is to dr zakir for enlightening uh, us again and and reaching our knowledge on islam and also teaching us on what to do and trying to spread islam um shall we first give him a, a round of applause in our usual way of thanking <laughs> and shall we end uh, the evening with the tasbih kifara surah al ars bismillahir rahmanir rahim subhanakallahu wa bihamdika ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta wa astaghfiruka wa atubu ilaik بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هو أصر إن الإنسان لا في خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصل الحق وتواصل الصبر السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته.